This is a blaring out with Eric Blair show, and today I'm here with former member of Kaja Goo Goo and Kaja, Nick Beggs, currently on tour with Howard Jones. How you doing today? Well, I'm fine. How was Kaja Goo Goo formed? Oh, blimey. Um, Kaja Goo Goo was formed in 1982 uh, by myself and four other gentlemen. Uh, we, four, four of us were living in Leighton Buzzard and one of them was living in London and it was a, a chance meeting um, with some people who knew somebody else put us together and uh, said you should talk to this guy you should call this guy and uh, contrary to popular belief that we were manufactured by a record company we actually did it all ourselves so how did you get your first record deal we got help from Nick Rhodes from Duran Duran who heard the demos and presented the same tape back to the A&R department at EMI that we had only sent in like three weeks earlier. And uh, then they went, hey, this is, you're right, this, this is slamming. <laughs> they said that in an English accent like that, it's slamming, and uh, they signed us. So what are your fondest memories from the White Feathers period? Uh, sacking Limal, I think. You're, <laughs> no. oh, really? <laughs> no, 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 no the fine. <laughs> that was mean. Um, the finest memories of the White Feathers um, album was the camaraderie between the band members that's for sure in the early stages there was a lot of uh, empathy and a lot of excitement I remember hearing when the, the, the single Too Shy had gone into the American charts it already been number one in seven European countries wow. you know it, it was an amazing time we had quite a lot of hits in Europe and uh, we were if we'd stayed together we probably could have been the, the next wham but there were problems there was a lot of problems and it soon kind of went sour and uh, do you feel that the success brought about some of the problems uh, yes always does it's endemic if you haven't got um, strong relationships between the individuals then you, they become fractal and you know polarized and then you have in fighting and then it's all over so what was it like working with Nick Rhodes and Colin Thurston on White Feathers and what did Colin Thurston bring to the mix and what did Nick Rhodes bring to the mix as far as production I've always really admired Nick Rhodes I think he's a, a really talented ideas man yeah kind of I think that's the way he sees himself he, he always kind of put himself down as far as his playing abilities yeah. are concerned but he's he was always the first one to say that me light not right that's a Birmingham accent, you see. Um, that mid late's not right. That's oh, the okay. translation. All right. um, and uh, or he'd say, try shortening it or making it longer. Or I think you should change the synth sound there. He was great like that. And Colin Thurston and him had this great relationship because they'd done two hit albums with Duran. Yeah. And uh, with with Colin's engineering skills and Nick's kind of overview, it was a very good team. Very good team. So what does Colin do? What, how does he shape the album? He, he brought his um, experiences as an engineer. Okay. Um, and he did have some great production ideas as well, but overall the production of the, of the material was uh, very demo democratic really between Nick, Colin and the band. A lot of the production so ideas. So you guys had a lot of input too? Very much so. I remember the lot, we had three mixes of Too Shy right at the end. And I went in and I said, we've got to go with the one where the bass is louder. And that was the one of that course. did it. So why did Lamal leave the band? Lamal was actually fired from the band. Okay. Because, uh, <laughs> wow. I've heard a lot of different things. Yeah, well, this is, this is the true reason. Okay. He was, became very difficult to work with, and he wanted to change the royalty base. He wanted to split the royalties with me and him. And it was a group thing. Yeah. And I didn't think that was right. Power Mad Killers, like the Red Skull. <laughs> <laughs> That's from a Captain America comic book. All right, okay. But, but Red Skull was like a <laughs> yeah, Nazi I liked it. guy. But. I enjoyed it. Well, he, no, he never, you know, he wasn't a Nazi or anything yeah. like that. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard there was like some religious differences, actually. No. So that's not true. No. How did the recording session for Extra Play go? And was that a good time for you? Do you know, Extra Play was a really funny thing because the record company was saying, you know, we got you guys are great, you've got a great sales base in America, but it's a different lead singer. Yeah. You know, it's me. I was the lead singer. We, got a, we can't release the album, we don't feel it's right for America, but we would like to take some tracks off the first album, some tracks off the, the next album, and take some B-sides and make this whole thing. So we thought, well, what, what are we going to do? I mean, it's, it's kind of like it was a hybrid. It actually yeah. wasn't an official release in Europe, that record, Extra Play. 
and it kind of it was a funny thing and we had this track and I can't I think it was turn your back on me it was a remix and um, it was kind of going up the American dance charts and set the 12 inch was really doing great so every week we were getting billboard we we're going ah it's number 10 this week ah great great and um, then we released it as a single it just went phew <laughs> it wasn't really? a hit <laughs> really yeah. uh. they like they like the dance version of it but they didn't like the actual seven inch version so it was kind of a little flirtation with the American music chart there. So you never did you never toured to support that album? No, we were on we were on the eve of doing a sellout tour of America with a number five hit in the charts when we sacked Limal. And the reason we did that was because it, we were just at the point where we thought we might kill him if we had, if we went on the road with him. You didn't want to do the yes thing and have separate tour buses or separate. No, no because because we were you know we were kids. I mean, I was 21. I couldn't deal with that. It was like I did get in the music industry to make money. I got uh, in the music industry to do what I want to do yeah. in the way that I want to do it. And that's why I'm as broke as a church mouse now. Did the record company just take you guys for a ride? No, or? no. What happened was um, we ended up being ripped off really badly by our manager. Yeah, he kind of misappropriated funds and all the, when the accountants were sending out the letters telling us what the account state status was, he had them all sent to him. And then when we started asking questions, he'd say things like, don't worry your pretty little head about it, just write the next album, you know. So there's no legal recourse? Well, there is, but in England, if you don't take action within six years, the, the case would not stand up. Plus, you know, the other thing is, it takes a lot of energy and focus yeah, and yeah, money I know. and hatred, we know actually. How it is. And I, yeah. we all decided, let's just get on with our lives. Let, 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 let him go into the world and be who he's going to be and we've all had to reinvent ourselves you know each one of us has gone off Limal's gone off and done his own thing and he's done very well at it I really respect him for that and um, Jez has got a very successful equipment hire company mm -hmm. Steve is teaching Stuart runs a computer software company he's doing really well cool and um, I'm still playing professionally as well so. yeah because you're an awesome bass player well you're very kind mere memories from the crazy people's right to speak now if you didn't tour on extra play at that point what made you guys go and do this next record well we did tour Europe oh okay we didn't come to America and how did that go for you it was you? great it was sell out dates okay. it was great and I was fronting it up and it just felt strange but okay um, but I have a lot of memories of this very place because of that uh, crazy people's right to speak because it was recorded in Redondo Beach oh wow and uh, we stayed up, at the, up in um, the Hollywood Hills and Beverly Hills for two months and it was a really wonderful experience and uh, just being here at this hotel and walking around and seeing the Chinese theater again brings back incredible memories. So you like LA? Oh my god, I love America. I think America is a wonderful life-giving place. How often do you, do you come here to visit? Four times a year. I, don't, I come here to work four times a year. I don't come here to visit very often. Were any of the songs on Extra Play and Crazy People's Right to Speak written with a Christian point of view? At the time, yes they were. Yeah. And was that your point of view? Uh -huh. or? I was very focused in that area at that time. I feel very differently about the whole aspect now. Um, but I was, you know, I was 21. I'd had a terrible childhood. Mm -hmm. I'd gone through really awful things. And I was trying to work it all out. And this kind of focus of faith thing really kept me on the straight and narrow. I'm really glad because I think it probably saved my life, to be honest. Um, you know, I'm 37 now and I feel very differently about religion and that whole area. I, I still hold uh, true to a lot of those ideals, but I embrace a lot of other ones that don't necessarily fit in with Christianity. What's next for Nick Beggs? Well, of course, I'm going to continue working with Howard forever because he's a lovely man. Yeah. And also a genius. One of the greatest songwriters ever, I think. His yeah. songs are just astonishing. And to see those people out there every night yeah. responding to those songs. Your bass playing, it fits perfectly in with his sound. It's, it's, a, it's a great honor to work with him. But I'm just about to start a project with John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin as well. Two bass players? Yep. Now what are you going to do in that? I'm going to play Mitty Chapman stick. And he's going to play regular bass? He's not playing anything regular. He plays everything really strange. And it's a trio. There's a drummer. Who's John. the drummer? We haven't found him yet. <laughs> get Bozio. <laughs> well, Terry Bozio would be amazing. Yeah, get him. He'll well, do it. You got his number? 
No, but I know you can get it. Terry, Nick Terry, Banks. listen, give us a call because John's looking for a drummer. You would rock on it. Yeah, you bad mother. Yeah, I, he, you know he's not going to say no to John Paul Jones, and you're Actually, an awesome bass player. That's a really good player. idea. You know, that's a really good idea. Rock on. You too, bro. Do John. Thank you very much, Nick, for being on the Blaring Out with Eric Blair show. Keep rocking, dude. Promise. The Blaring Out show.